final installment of our series on Horatio's Guide to Maladaptive Daydreaming. Part 5 is titled, Was It All Just a Lie? And uh, <laughs> that was really dramatic. But uh, uh, talking about that with us today is Lisa. Hello, everybody. Hello, Lisa. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. As per tradition, we shall be starting in the middle. <laughs> because... No, we don't want to start in the middle. <laughs> I'm one, I, I'm one of these, we were starting at the beginning. We're, we're going to try to go from the beginning and then go to the end. Okay, this is our last shot. This is our last shot. So, okay, I guess I guess we can try. Try, try to go through in order on the last one. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I would say, okay, so her opening paragraph, I think, is pretty good. Um, mm hmm the mechanisms driving fantasy addiction break down with the recognition of absent, with the poignant realization that your characters are not here, that they've never been here and never existed, that they were never yours. You're alone and your most ardent passion, the one thing that dissipates meaninglessness, is a lie. Just a self-crafted lie. I did paraphrase that slightly. Mm -hmm. Oh. Stifle your existential turmoil. Is it? Was it really that cheap in the end? Well, okay. I, I wouldn't exactly say that that was a that that's a one to one comparison. I would only disagree sli slightly. And for all of the fancy wording, which by the way I enjoy quite, like Aratia, if you ask me, has always had some some really good word choice, and I have like zero problems with that. Um, like she's a, a fairly 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 good writer. It was it's nice to read her works. Or like this this five piece works of it's nice to read, but let me tell you, um, I agree with most of it. It's pretty good. I just wasn't really like like right. So she asks, it was it really that cheap in the end? Uh, and you know, if you read forward, you can see what she says. But I think that as as a maladaptive daydreamer, it really isn't like cheap. Like for something that is, it's like so close to us. Like yeah. maladaptive daydreaming is so close that you can't really call it cheap. Even as like an addiction, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't disagree with this opening. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it's an important part to focus on, and this is the part mm -hmm. that she's choosing to focus on. I, <laughs> you know, I don't. I mean, yeah, they're they're not they're not here. But no no maladaptive daydreamer was ever confused that they weren't here. Mm hmm. Well, I I I personally focused on like that. That's like the introduction. That's the opening. But the thing that really sort of, like, the, the segue, the segui, is was it really cheap in the end, right? Because that's the important part to focus on. Is yeah. are your Because she's, she's mentioned it in the past, right? right? Is are your maladaptive daydreams cheap, right? And the fact that they're not real, does that also make it cheap? Right, yeah. I don't think so. Lisa, what, I don't, <laughs> what do you think of this opening? So it feeds again in my um, general criticism of the whole thing this is basically like me talking about this is probably not me taking apart every single sentence because the way that i um worked with this text was more in a general sense and trying to identify certain intentions clues some kind of patterns or some certain style um it's I don't know it's it, it it's like the 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 author has like I feel this yeah this thing where they try to um get you get the reader um drawn into or in a way shaken deeply within themselves because this kind of you know this 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 um this piece of text is it's it's very strongly written the word word choice, uh, I absolutely agree, um, is definitely very entertaining, very nice to read, uh, very interesting. Um, but it uses very strong words, like um, or like sentences, sentences like "you are alone" and "your most ardent passion," your trump card. That one thing that dissipates meaninglessness and takes away the feeling of crippling loneliness is a lie, just a self-crafted lie to stifle your existential turmoil. That sounds very strong. It's 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 like very cool. 
and stuff. <laughs> yeah, but, it's, like, it's like who's trying to inspire existential turmoil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, that's, this is like the thing um, that I, this is like a, a trend in this, in this text. This is a reoccurring theme. Um, by using by using very strong language and by by trying to be to be as blunt and sort of I would even say dramatic as possible to shake something to move something within the reader and you know this is and it, it's sort of like something um, which is which is a theme that I have um, identified in the text in in general not only this chapter. Mm -hmm. is sort of like a style to write it hot and cold to to do like really like portray something as the worst of the worst then to uh kind of rather relativize to um to dump it down a bit again and then to from this kind of place where the reader is is shaken disturbed ashamed or feared to them ease them in into the the desired um the desired path of the author yeah um because i mean the following sentence the, you know after after this really you know aggressive opening is what we call md is not fundamentally wrong and it is you know it starts telling you how you know it's not that fucked up you're just craving life so i definitely see that cycle and i gotta say i kind of have a love-hate relationship with it like i can see that a lot of maladaptive daydreamers maybe, you know, do need to be shaken a bit. But like, god damn, girl. God damn. Chill out. Yeah, she, they, she, she's, you know, that's been a theme through a lot of her, like, sort of work that we've read through. Is it's like, it's very, it's very poignant. It's very, very, it's very evocative, right? A lot of her words mm. are evocative. Yeah. But... And then, and you could, you might be able, you might get the wrong idea, but it's, uh, okay, I guess I would put it this way, right? So, is it just me, but when I, when I was reading through this, I imagined sort of a metronome, right, that, that is good, like, ticking back and forth really slowly from, like, one side to the other, like, positive to negative, back to positive again. Yeah, she tends to go back and forth through positive and like really positive and like really negative emotions, which is really good to hook your reader. But like if you're in like pain, like because you because now that all five of them are here, right? And we've talked before about how they were each individual posts on a forum. But now if you can read one to five, like one to another, it's like it'll keep you hooked for like reading the whole five parts. But it's it's like uh, oftentimes this is the first like piece a lot of maladaptive daydreamers are introduced to which is good uh i think there's a lot of good points to be had in here but a lot of these really negative emotions that she sort of like keeps you hooked on is just it, i don't know it's not exactly destructive i don't i don't think destructive is the right word for it but it, it is really rough to hear as like someone coming into the community that like um she so like she mentioned in the introduction that like your loneliness is a lie. It's just a your crippling loneliness is a lie, self crafted lie, existential turmoil. It's just like the lows are really low, right? And it's it's I wouldn't say it's like hard to read, but it just kind of hurts a little bit. And I don't think it's entirely correct. Yeah, I get um I get what you mean. This is um um but uh something you pointed out, especially with the very um creative and liberal use uh, of words um that you know this is this is as well um you know a piece of creative writing it has definitely taken a lot of creative uh liberties in the way that it's uh delivered it's not only a cotton dry um way of of describing a, a task or something like that or, or a skill or a method um big and it's and it, yeah, that, that's probably the intention of the whole thing. As Dimas, which uh, said that, um, you know, um, you th you thought that uh, you think that it's not really wrong to shake daydreamers a little bit. And mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of there are a lot of people, and there are a lot of um, people, especially I, as I can recall, the the author was like an undergrad psychology student at that time. From what Dima told me, I I believe so. Yeah, I don't know if she has a background in writing, 
Um, that was a thing I wanted to ask you guys. I don't want to get us too off track, but if you think this um, was purposefully done or if it's maybe just the way she expresses herself naturally. Mm -hmm. Both. No, I'm, I think I think that she. this is just the way she expresses herself. I mean, she could have learned this kind of, of, of like evocative writing and this kind of wording uh, through her psychology degree uh, because it's a good, like I said before, it's a good way to keep people hooked. And if you know that kind of psychology and that's what you want, um, in that case, yeah, she's doing it intentionally. But like, it's, that could also just be the way they express themselves, right? Like she, it, it, how how do I put this? It's like you. It doesn't matter if it they, like there's a difference, right? They often meld together because the way you express yourself changes depending on what you learn and what you're uh, exposed to, like in, at regular intervals. Like so, if you're in a if you're in a psychology major or sociology major, right? And you're regularly ex like uh, what is it? If you are regularly exposed to these kinds of tactics, tactics, or you're regularly exposed to these kinds of um, methods that would keep people engaged one it's good for writing like creative writing in particular because it keeps people uh very much hooked on the writing that you have which is different from like a paper because you, you weren't here for this lisa but on a in an on in an earlier podcast when we went over an earlier part we mentioned the difference between this and a paper because papers are, are are more off they're being made more frequently about maladaptive daydreaming these days but like they're very cut and dry and so maybe they're more correct than this but this has more feeling so people regularly come back to this because it's easier to read or it's more entertaining to read um and that's because they use a lot of this evocative writing that they might have used uh during their psychology major and i don't think there's much of a difference between whether or not it's how they express themselves or they got it from their degree because the, like i said before it's like the same thing right um, which is why tying it all together, it's just sort of, it's much more interesting to read. It hooks you more. And it's just how they, I I think, it's how they express themselves because they they just kind of learned that. And they just incorporated it into their writing. Uh, yeah, I would definitely agree that it's just, that it's, of course, um, you know, personal style, just that way. On the other hand, sometimes you you have different communication styles for different purposes, right? You 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 talk differently to your boss than you would talk to your mother, and um, you adapt different communication styles. Or when you work in customer service, you talk different to them than you would talk, um, I don't know, to like some some street vendor, right? It's diff different types of of com communication styles. Um, but so the thing, maybe I should, so maybe, you know, maybe give a little bit of history. I've been more or less, uh, being forced, uh, since I was 11 years old to get psycho, uh, to get psychotherapy. Um, it was not, it was not voluntary. It was all involuntary. Uh, and, uh, I have been through those, those many, many years, um, until I was probably 21 or 22, um, have been through the hands of a lot of different psychotherapists and most of them, because it's the most, con it's considered the most effective form. And it's also the most, um, popular form right now, um, to, a, I have been through a lot of, um, cognitive behavioral therapy or just behavioral therapy which is also the one that's been regularly recommended for people cutting down their daydreaming. Uh, and the thing is that basically the only real thing that people that are a lot of, that are very oriented to behavioral therapy is that they just want a change in behavior or they just want a change in the things that come out of your mouth. And this is, you know, and when this happens, they feel like they have done a good job because this is the aim. This is the aim. They just they want you to to basically speak after their mouth to to repeat things like I am lovable, I am worthy and stuff like that. Or to to um, copy behaviors that they have previously um, told you about that are that are good for you. Having a structure, having a morning routine, going on a run, uh, talking to to certain friends. And, you know, if, if you do these things, if you just copy whatever they say, um, you know, on the surface level, most of them are then satisfied with their work and see it as successful. Most of them. Those are not the good ones. And 
So the thing is about how, how, how do you achieve when you have a client? How do you achieve a very, um, you know, a very uh, quick and drastic change in behavior and language? How, how would you achieve that? If you think about it in your real life, um, if you have someone in front of you whose behavior or whose language you want to change, you would probably say stuff like them, something like, oh, I don't know, I think you shouldn't say that. Or, mm, I don't know if this is really good for you. Or, huh, aren't you embarrassed? Or, um, oh, this seems kind of dangerous. Or stuff like, um, that's not really you. I don't believe this is really you. Or someone else has been pushing this on you or something like that, which are all tactics to um, make the individual uh, more insecure in themselves to feel ashamed, shamed for being, you know, um, being afraid of being shamed for uh, by by their peers, by the people around them, which is a very strong urge in humans to be accepted by their peers because we are very social creatures. And, um, you know, fear of failure, fear of failing academically or um, career-wise, failing as a human being, because a lot of us or most of us, we just want to be good human beings. We don't want to be bad ones. And the thing is that a lot of a lot of people who study psychology and who want to work as therapists or they already work as therapists, especially in behavioral therapy, um, a lot of them they resort to tactics of guilt tripping, shaming, and installing fear in their clients to get a very uh, drastic and quick change in their behavior and language. And this is what I'm seeing through all of, of the works of the, the this particular big work, not only the chapter, but the whole guide of um, the author, which to me completely explains passages with those extremely um, aggressive, hostile, intense, um, provocative, evoking language. Because this is this is all the author is doing all over again. It's installing fear and shame and guilt into someone by then offering them a way in which they can relieve themselves of shame and guilt and fear by following their instructions, by following their worldview, by following what they think is the right, like the the real self of the of the client of the reader. And um so this is this is where I'm coming from. This is my perspective on the text, and um, you know uh, what what my what my whole thing with it is, and why um, I have uh, you know I've, immediately after I've read it for the first time, I've never I read this text a few months ago for the first time. I immediately jumped to I want to um, participate. I want to contribute to the podcast because it has it, it, it's such to me it's very obvious. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I think that's why there's like, okay, so there's a, there seems to be a, a really big, uh, from what Dimmer has said, there seems to be a really big, uh, how, how do I put this? There is a, I wouldn't say there's a movement, but there's a, a huge portion of the community that like to hold this uh, text up on a pez pedestal. Like this is the definitive text or like a lot of people like this and think of it very positively. Um. And like, what's the word for it? I I know it. I know it. Uh, criticism of this text is not like really well. It's not regarded really well. Like historically, a lot of people don't want to criticize or don't let people criticize this text uh, in the community because I think, as far as I'm aware, there's a lot of people who come into the community reading this first, so they think really highly of this text, and that would probably make sense. Right, with this evocative sort of with this evocative wording and this these sort of mental tactics to sort of like push their worldview onto the reader. And with all of this evocative uh, language, it makes it very easy to sort of accept this as the way that reality is for maladaptive daydreamers. That would explain a couple things to me in particular, because I don't like I, I've only started reading this text recently. Um, and that wasn't my, this wasn't my introduction to the community, but for those of, uh, for those of us who this is the, the introduction, that would make a lot of sense, right? It's like using this evocative wording and this, uh, sort of worldview that is then pushed onto the reader. I wouldn't like personally, 
I don't think of it super negatively. I don't think of this text super negatively, but because uh, I'm not really sort of really moved by it all that much. Like I get a lot of what they're saying, but it doesn't really move me. Um, but like I can I can see what you're saying, like through all of this really strong language. They're sort of pushing a narrative. They're pushing a worldview onto the reader. Um, but through your lens, Lisa, I can sort of see a lot of what happens in the community being ex explained. Uh, people don't take criticism of it because it's the first thing they've read in the community. For those who it's not, or for those who have only started reading it recently or only learned of it after the fact, um, that might be, they might be more willing to criticize it. But I'm only mentioning this because Dimmers, we've we've made, uh, we've talked about in the past how this is a little bit more difficult to criticize. It's just held up a little bit higher than everything else, right? Because there's, uh, like I mentioned a second ago, there have been a lot of papers that have come out recently about maladaptive daydreaming, but they're just really dry, and they're not easy reads, even though they may or may not be more correct, right? People will look to this instead, because it's just more interesting. Or they have, it has this evocative wording, right? Even though it may, might not be good for the reader, because they're pers pushing a worldview that might not be correct, or might be misleading. Yeah, it's a polarizing. Polarizing. That's a word that I like because that sounds correct. That sounds way better than the hundred words I used and didn't make sense. You're welcome. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I think um because yeah, it's it was one of the first things ever written like cohesively like this about maladaptive daydreaming, including studies. Like when this came out, there was only like what three, four studies, something like that, half a dozen maybe tops, mm -hmm. and then there was this. <clears throat> so it gained a foothold very early. It's still to this day, um, kind of in a league of its own as far as writing on maladaptive daydreaming goes. Mm -hmm. There's not many like it. Yeah, there's well. there's not no. other things like this. Um, so I think it's a combo. You know, it was early. Um, it's polarizing it's um it's talking about md in in a way that like you don't see in a lot of other sources and it's yeah it's not entirely wrong either i would say like i, <laughs> I it, there's a lot wrong with it <laughs> that we've we've gone over I it's think. not entirely wrong but it's not entirely correct either but yeah but there's but there's a lot in there that really resonates but i think it I was going to say, yeah, but like if I had to sum up a feeling like in one word that this gives me, I do agree with Lisa that that overarching vibe is fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so personally, I would say um, on how there are a lot of things in there that are um, right and uh, it's not completely wrong. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I feel like the things that are like that feel right. They are just kind of being swept under the carpet or they they are kind of like um, instrumentalized, like um, in a way that they, they are just used um, to, to push the author's point even further because there are a lot of things in those texts that, that play on fear and that play on guilt and on and shame and um, all those things. And a lot on um always like i think they're like words of like discipline and maturity and immaturity and cheapness and quality and you know there's a lot of evaluation there's a lot of it's not neutral it evaluates a lot of very strong and big concepts um but the the things that are actually um good with them they usually they come out of uh, a very uh like a very very established um school of psychology which is humanist psychology this psychology it it claims that there is a certain essence in people an individual essence maybe something like a soul it can be compared to or something you know like like a like a set of completely individual traits from which every or like most human action is uh, motivated by and the thing to make and to make a, a, a person feel feel sick or um, disordered or maladaptive um, is 
the the way to do it is to to suppress these individual traits in in, in the person and not allowing them to lift them out to shame them to feel make them feel guilty to make them fear um just you know living out um what their their own personal truth and we have a lot of that in that text too it's a lot based on humanist psychology it's based on stuff like you know um MD is an extension of you. It is you to the very core of your being. It, it, it mentions things like like a core, or it's a game of hide and seek where you're both hunter and the hunted, but you have forgotten where to search. You have forgotten where you hide yourself. There's a lot of self-talk about the self, about something that's that's not changeable, that's unchangeable, and that can't be can't be defeated through conditioning. And um, there's there's a lot of in here too and this is because i'm more of um because of my experiences my personal experiences um i'm you know way more um biased towards uh humanist psychology now as the as the superior school <laughs> um mm -hmm. that um that this is this is what i see and those are the positives and i would probably say that um a lot of the things that people read in this text um as right is also it's also humanism. It's it's also uh, humanism. It's it's human psychology. It's the talk of you are a great human being. You have things in you that you want to live out. You are hungry for life and your cravings for life, as uh, quoted. And um, there is you know you have you have so much to create and to give. And maladaptive daydreaming is just um, pulling it in a direction that is not really purposeful, intentional, that is not um, productive, that is not rooted in the material world, which is all completely true in and of itself. But the thing is that we can just sit here and say, okay, maybe there is something inherently, um, in, inherently unchangeable um, in a person that has to be lived out one or the other way. Um, but the thing is how we go about this. And if we are going to sit here and go like, okay, but there is, there is a good way and there is a bad way. And the bad way here is obviously maladaptive daydreaming and is, is, is portrayed as only that. There is really not much about maladaptive daydreaming. It is only used um, as a way for, for just inspiration or for, um, very utilitarian in the way that they just want to pick things out of the dreams and say, okay, those things we keep, those things we, um, we forget about and those things we will just live out. And this is again, um, it feeds again into, to, to the point I made earlier about, um, a certain narrative um that is presented here the the narrative and the worldview specifically of the author about um what values certain things have and uh, what don't so you mentioned that there that Horatio is pushing forward a, a narrative of fear a narrative of fear and demonizing a lot of maladaptive daydreaming right um yeah as a as a technique because the mm -hmm. author themselves they obviously um don't see see value in maladaptive daydream or they they try to um have the um value they only attach to certain things they don't they don't strive for wholeness they don't strive for oneness they just want one separate um desired reality without accepting all the excess that comes with it okay I think the author would disagree with that. I don't think you're wrong, but I think that they would disagree. Like if Horatio was sitting here, and I obviously can't speak for the author, but from my understanding of, of what I have read, what they've put out into the world here, they would say that they are going for oneness, that that that, that MD, oh my God, ugh, fuck. Yeah, I'm not very articulate either. <laughs> um, because that's what they that's what they keep saying. They keep saying that you are there in your fantasies. Um, you know, that that you love in your fantasies means you can love in the real world. So it's holding you back from oneness, from discovering your complete self. And if you if you are able to take that love into the real world, 
then or whatever is being expressed in your fantasies that's how you would find the wholeness you had uh you had mentioned that they use fear a lot and i think i ended up i missed i ended up missing like i can see where they're using they don't the way they push maladaptive daydreaming and sort of demonize it a little bit and that they want you to be in the real world and they want you to be mindful uh, and they sort of push maladaptive daydreaming away a little bit like i can see that but like the fear never resonated with me like i never i never got that but i think the reason why is i'm just not a fearful guy of this like these days i'm not really feel fearful of maladaptive, maladaptive daydreaming I've, I've been a proponent on the podcast a couple of times and i've mentioned this a couple of times how uh, i think it's good to work with your maladaptive daydreaming like your maladaptive daydreams rather than toss it out like i can see that they want you to sort of toss it out a little bit um but like i never got the fear part mostly because i just personally have never feared well I guess not never, but uh, these days I don't really feel maladaptive daydreaming, so that just flew right over my head. Now that you're pointing it out, I can see it, but like I don't feel any fear personally. I think, yeah, I think the operative word in what you just said though was these days. Like if yep. you're, yeah, <clears throat> if I was like, younger, I would totally see exactly, it and be like, oh my, oh my yeah. god, my maladaptive daydreams are the worst thing on the planet. This is how they get you. This is yeah. how they get you in a vulnerable state. <laughs> Well, yeah, and it makes sense, right? Is it's like if you're like young, or even if you're older, and you just like, and you don't like the fact that your life is being taken over by something that is stuck in your head, or is like mostly or like entirely in your head, and you want to be in the real world, it makes for a very good way to get people to listen to you and like want to get rid of it. I don't think it's healthy. I think I've mentioned this before, and I'm going to mention it again. I don't think a lot of the destructive wording Erasure uses is very healthy, but I mean. You know, hey, you mentioned it before that she's sort of demonizing all this, but demonizing and using a lot of fear because they get you vulnerable. And then once they get you vulnerable, then she goes and uh, and then she pushes forward her. There's a word for it. What is it? Worldview? Her ph no, philosophy, right? her philosophy, philosophy, her th her thoughts, her uh, her like what what is the. There's a word for it, but what she what she thinks. God, I'm, today yeah. is not the day for me. Yeah, but there's exactly. a word for it. What's the word? Is that is it philosophy? Like your personal philosophy? Yeah, your, for example, you could call it or her view, or her worldview, or her opinion, or, your, or her, her modus operandi. Her, her dogma be could be as well. Um, That's a good one. Um. So, uh, with the whole whole dogma thing, and with the um. You 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 kind of really got behind what I tried to say is you know trying to install a sort of vulnerability or even desperateness in um, people in readers in in clients um, to make them more susceptible to taking on a new view and this is in a way um, a lot of times it's it's literally like like a, a method in behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy in in confronting someone with something very shocking or to make them shake to make them feel vulnerable to make them feel desperate to make them feel at their lowest they try to break you to then get get in more into into your your mo your most inner and um, a lot of people think that this is a very legitimate um, tactic. I have completely a different opinion on that because I'm mostly against violence, which also includes emotional violence, which is it is nothing but emotional violence. Um, but um, so the thing is that usually, you know, those tactics can also be used a little bit uh, less destructive, a little bit more considerate, a little bit more ethical um, if the person who uses them is actually uh, someone who is capable of um, showing a concept that has been um, introduced by Carl Rogers, um, radical empathy. And radical empathy also includes taking, especially in humanism, what is already there in the person and actually nurturing it and trying to find out with the other person what is their worldview, what, what is there that can be turned into something big and, and beautiful and all-encompassing and complete. But um, a lot of people, like not only this psychology undergrad, but also a lot of practitioners, they are completely incapable of having like the sort of radical empathy. They are not capable of going that far. And therefore, 
you know, they just they just kind of go, okay, um, so your worldview is kind of shit. Uh, here is my here is mine. Just take mine. You don't need an individual one. Just take mine. And if you fail to take on mine, um, you know, you kind of fail therapy. <laughs> Bro, that is I, wild. Yeah. I don't disagree though. Like, um, y- you know, if I had to read into the, if I had to presume things about Erasia's mindset, you know, which we can only do from from this one blog, but um, just based on this and the way it's written, I do feel like this author feels like they have it figured out they know what's wrong they know how to get to what's right and they're trying to get you to get to what's right but uh, yeah like lisa said it's it's their own version of what's right and they're trying to show you um and i did want to say though sort of while we're on that topic that um i think that's definitely something you need to be aware of in people when you know look out for it and, you know, when people sound like that, you know, maybe shy away a bit and definitely don't buy anything from them. Aracia is not, she's not selling us anything. I mean, sure, she's selling us her worldview, but like there's, there's no donate button. She's not some self-help guru trying to sell you a cure. Um, there is somebody out there who's doing that though so i just want you to know that it happens like <laughs> like i don't think that erasia has a motive here except to help us maybe she's not going about yeah, it course. the best way but of course, I, I but, think yeah you know the road <laughs> the road to hell is paved with good intentions yeah, mm-hmm. I'm, gonna be, yeah. I'm gonna be honest with you here while listening to you explain all those psychological tactics, all I can think of is, man, that is nasty. That's nasty, and by God, is that genius. That's ridiculous. And people get mad at me because they're like, well, that's not good. It's like, no, it's not good, but I would have never, I would have never even been close to considering that. That is, that is insane. That's ridiculous. Can I bring up to They, they do wanna... this in um, religious cults as well, by the way. Ooh. I don't Ooh, that's something to... to be wary yeah, of. Yeah, like, I don't, I don't, okay, I don't, <sighs> I don't want to offend our guest, you know, but we've been talking so much about how this inspires fear, you know, this blog. You're you're making me afraid of therapy. <laughs> um, so this is okay. Um, so maybe people listening to me, um, they might be also they might be already aware that I have a very sad worldview on those things because I have gone through many, many years of very bad experiences and have been um, very active in, you know, like the anti psychiatry space. Um, so, which is, you know, a bit more like it's a political movement basically. And, um, and also if you're going to tap more into spirituality, you're going to also get more critical because, you know, spirituality is then the only alternative most of the time. And, um, also alternative psychology, like humanist psychology, which is also like completely scientifically, um, been like been approved and, but it's just not very popular. And I think also for political reasons, but let's, let's not, uh, dive into this any further. So, um, yeah, I don't I don't want anyone to be like completely afraid of therapy, but I think I want people to be educated about the dangers of choosing the wrong person and of pursuing something you have not been uh, well informed um, about beforehand. A lot of people, they just say, for example, I'm doing psychotherapy and then they don't even know which kind is it what kind of is it you know there is it behavior one okay what kind of behavior one is it so there's so many therapies out there and, and a lot of people they are not aware of this and they they see it as like a very general thing and they are not really aware that behind every single um kind of therapy and behind every single therapist there is a there is a worldview and there is a philosophy attached to that and when you go into therapy as a very vulnerable person who is looking for new ideas inspirations and um a new path for themselves because they have been dissatisfied with the current one or um then you are always going to take on part of the views of your therapist you know before people they go into therapy or before they consider some someone someone's views they should really get a very good rundown on what their views are and what alternatives are there and because Mm -hmm. a lot of time and i feel and i feel this is such a popular document 
um, because one, it's it's one of the most um, the, the oldest and the most generally um, popular ones, and the ones that is written that way because papers they are not that polarizing; they are very cut mm. and dry. Um, but it's also, you know, I think a lot of people they don't really want to hear criticism about that because it really is one of the only alternative and comprehensive views on that topic. It's kind of unfortunate that it's only really this one or a few other ones, and there isn't really um, like like sort of um, a market of alternatives. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just about the only one that's like this, and there's not really all like you said, there's not really alternatives. And since this is one of the first that you read, this is often like the established way of thinking, right? Um, and while I don't entirely agree, like I don't entirely disagree, like this is a, I think a little bit of a mixed bag. When it comes to the stuff that I would, uh, I would take and leave. The fear is something that doesn't resonate with me, so I would totally leave that. Um, but when it comes to, like for instance, right? Uh, she has some very point. Uh, they have. She has some very. Uh, I wouldn't call them deep cuts, right? But she has some very strong language, and she's very. Uh, po some of those statements. Some of the statements she makes are very pointed, right? Like she says here towards the top, what we call MD is not fundamentally wrong. And then she's period, new paragraph. So she like the way that she, fra uh, not frames her writing, but the way that she formats her writing is very strong, which means that whatever the ratio believes, right, she feels very strongly about it, which makes it easy to uh, sort of grasp onto. <laughs> We've kind of moved on to like the part where she's talking about reality okay so oh god no this isn't we're we're, yeah. oh, we're jumping around again oh god no no we're not jumping around this is the next part she talks about this is the next oh, topic whew. she moves on to don't worry Phew. don't worry Phew, i got good. you i got you <laughs> <laughs> this war is not about fantasies and realities it's about you and your ability to love overcoming addiction to fantasy does not mean finally learning to love reality it means rediscovering that self that you sent into exile Mm -hmm. did i send it into exile though yeah did you <laughs> yeah well that's the thing right is it's like it's per person and i don't wouldn't say I, I sent it into exile i just would say i put it into time out uh, for, <laughs> for a little bit isn't that exile or is that like indefinite time out exile is indefinite time out I wouldn't say it's indefinite, but I, I I took it and put it into the other room because it was too loud and I got tired of it screaming at me. So I th I think they mean the same thing. I don't know. I think she's setting up a false dichotomy here. Like it's it's the strong one. words again. Yep. Yeah. She has very time out sounds different too. than exile. <laughs> well, get oh you to no, no. I mean, sure. I mean, learning to love reality versus rediscovering yourself. I don't think it's a versus. Mm -hmm. I think they're the same thing. Let me scroll down to see if I what can even find is where it is. Reality. It's not a... Yeah, and she does she does ask that down below. She says, Do you know what reality is? It doesn't exist. Reality is molded by feelings, made by feelings, born through its observa observers. It now that exist. is that is a very specific kind of philosophy yeah. we are dealing with. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Your reality is only to you what it is to you. Let's see. And I don't okay, maybe it's just because I don't have a philosophical brain, but I don't believe that reality is what it is. Yeah, it, you you you're a brain that experiences it in your own way. It can only ever be through feeling and observation, but you I sort of I don't think reality is as subjective as a philosopher would say it is. <laughs> like to me, reality, like like to me, I'll put it this way, reality is what you make of it, right? And if my reality is the like bond between my my daydreams and what I actually do in my daily life, right? I'd say that's what reality is. It's less uh, pragmatic is not the word, but it's like it's more abstract overall. What my reality is, it's that would be less of reality and more what my life, uh, how I live my life and what my life is to me. Uh, but at the same time, I would call it reality. I, don't, I think we only look at reality as abstract because mm -hmm. we're people prone to not living in it constantly. <laughs> I think the more mm -hmm. you interact with it, the less um, abstract it is. One mm -hmm. one additional viewpoint uh, from from a friend of mine who is actually um, a studied philosopher <laughs> said that um, 
the closer your perception of the world to reality is, the higher your chances of survival are. Right, less in your brain, more in the more in your surroundings. Is that what you're saying? In layman's term. I, I, I like that. I like your friend. I think I agree with that. I like your friend because your friend seems like a cool person. <laughs> not, not because of what they said. It's just literally they just sound pretty cool. You know, yeah, they I, are. Uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> you know, my, uh, no, when it comes to like your world view, right? Most people's world, world views, like their frame of reference is sort of, well, well, how would I say it? Um, sort of very narrow, pretty small by comparison. And I wouldn't, I'd say for us as maladaptive daydreamers, like we sort of are more in our heads than we are in the world around us, right? So our world view and our sort of frame of reference is more, more tuned by what we daydream than the reality that we have around us. And when it comes yeah, to... Yeah, I think... <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I, I think maladaptive daydreamers think they have a worldview, but they don't because they haven't actually lived in the world. Like, I don't know. The world isn't how you actually imagine it. Like, it's not. Like, <laughs> how many yeah, times? It isn't. Yeah. yeah, how many times have you imagined um, a scenario, a scenario playing out, and then you you try to act on that, but it doesn't play out the way you thought it would? Like, Well, this is, okay, Here here's a fun little story. Here's here's a fun little story, right? I wouldn't say like I I wouldn't say it's like small. I'd say it's like kind of skewed, right? The majority of my childhood, I went through just like huge maladaptive daydreaming spurts because I you know didn't have friends and all of that. Very solitary sort of guy in high school because all of my uh, I think I talked about this a little bit before. A lot of my classmates, a lot of my peers were just rotten. I, I mean, that's really mean, but I got really tired of them bullying me. So I just like daydreamed so hard that I just ignored them permanently. And they just eventually gave up because they're like, this guy is just way off his rocker. He is not here. <laughs> he is checked out. Right. That's smart. Uh, right. Does, I don't know if anybody else can like uh, can sympathize with that. But man, I was I was like, I'm just going to daydream so hard. I don't have to care. Um, and I got me through yeah. high school. So I was like, whatever. I, I I sympathize with that. I'm I had times in my life where I would be like, oh, you know what? I don't care. I can just lay down and listen to music. I don't yep, care about all of was. this shit. That's a very good survival tactic. You, yeah, you just ignore the reality and God. just survive. Yeah, and so, but that's what like how my high school went, right? So when I got to university, when I when I got to my undergrad career, uh, I. I, I was more like in line with what reality was because I didn't have the people who had seen me and like essentially socially exiled me for like my whole life. They were gone. Like this is a whole new backdrop, whole new set of people, right? So I was more like there in reality and I just decided to embrace the fact that I wasn't exactly like everybody else. And this is what one of my friends told me, right? When I first met him and he was like, I have never met anyone like you he said he told me he said you he i was like someone who had grown up on a desert island and then when i got to college or whatever i like finally started like i like was finally integrating into society so you're just strange so i would say that our worldview as maladaptive, and I, I do attribute that to maladaptive daydreaming because I just wasn't in society until I got to college, right? Because there was, I thought as a high schooler that there was nothing in reality for me. Well, we know now that there is, right? But back then I didn't think so. Um, so I would say that our worldview isn't exactly small. It's just really skewed, right? To something that's not exactly, it makes us like a sort of, I guess this is kind of mean to say, but we're like a really strange bunch, right? We're an unusual bunch of people because our worldview is determined by our daydreams and paracosms and what we've been daydreaming about for the majority of our lives, rather than like what everybody else learns, which is, oh, society is this way, the world is this way, right? We're just not all there. We're in our heads, which is like a reality that's slightly skewed, slightly color shifted, yeah. slightly to the left. Um, I don't, I think I, I just see dreams and the outside world. I don't call it reality. Um, the dreams, the outside world, but also things like, um, social media or video games. Those are just all different planes of existence in which we manifest. Mm -hmm. And all those different planes, all those different worlds that we can access, 
um, they all have different different rules. They follow different rules. It's like being on different planets and gravity works differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way, for example, um, time goes by or how we do an action or how we achieve certain things or how we control what's hap what is happening in the future, um, those those things are all different. And for, for the outside world, for example, right, it works all very differently, especially time, um, than, than in the dream world. In the dream world, time sometimes can can slow. One scene can play itself out over and over and over again in every minute detail. And sometimes time in the dream world, it passes really, really fast. One time you met a character and just um, two years pass by and you are married and have children with that character. But in reality, you know, like in the outside world, you know, what a lot of people call the only real reality, um, actually just 10 minutes passed, not two years. Um, mm -hmm. And this, this is how I see it. I see it just as different... Um, different kind of views of, of reality. For me, reality is this all encompassing thing is everything we can observe, experience, or that we can take in with, with our awareness, whatever it is, it, it's through feelings or through touch, you know, through our sensations. Um, maybe we perceive reality sometimes because we give an input and there is an output. Maybe we just think that we exist because people around us, they react to us when we uh, when we speak to them on the street or in our family homes. Maybe we think that video games, they are also sort of a reality because I give an input and something happens on screen and it happens in my will. I work, I, I walk this direction. The character I control walks this direction because I wanted it so. So um, me doing things in, in all different worlds they are at the end of it just a manifestation of one thing. Mm -hmm. You could even you could even extrapolate that a little bit further and be and say rather than planets or planes of reality, it's just like different cultures on our own planet, right? Like a lot of people see the yeah. world very differently because their frame, frames of reference are very different, right? So if we go with your example with like planets, right, and how gravity works differently, it's like when two people from different planets meet, they react different ways when they see each other right and they sort of learn from one another as you like meet them so try to pull it back to the way uh Aratia explains reality and the way that she frames it right it's like we are meeting the world where is it let me see exactly what the what the where it is uh let me find the exact quote as I explained in the third part, overcoming addiction to fantasy does not mean finally learning to love reality. It means rediscovering that yourself into egg, the self you sent into exile. Right? They are trying to pull yourself, like your like yourself from a different planet, your daydream planet, I suppose, and yourself from quote the real planet or the the reality planet, or the world Earth, I guess. And sort of taking these two people from, I guess, different cultures or different worlds and putting them together and trying to get them to talk to one another. For, like, they talk in different languages. They see the world differently, but it's trying to get those two to come together and become one. Does that make sense? Am I insane? It, it makes it makes sense, but it's um, it's not my view. So, um, mm. so you, you kind of took the thing with the, with the different planets and stuff, but um, no one, I think no one of us is home on those different planets you told mm. me about or is taking permanent residence mm. we are at the center of it because mm. even when we say oh i have only ever really lived in my daydreams we have existed in the outside world as well we have been you know mm. lying in our beds pacing around our hallways all the time we have been existing in the outside world we have been living there mm. even though if you, we don't feel like it it's maybe also because we maybe um, see living as, as differently. We have existed. Maybe we, we, we took most of our dreams and our creative energy, most of them, and, and put them into our daydreams. But I would even argue against that. A lot of us in the outside world, we have taken a lot of our creative energy 
and our all of our resources to um, create for us a world in which we can constantly escape to our daydreams. We made sure that no one is disturbing us in our sessions, and uh, we made we made sure to have the space that we need. We made sure we have the equipment, maybe the music, the headphones we need, and for all of those things, we did problem solving, we did creativity, and and all of us they found they found new ways. For me, for example, I was daydreaming. Um, I have been daydreaming since I was three or four years old. And at one point, of course, there comes always the time when it really conflicts with your uh, academic pursuits. Mm -hmm. And sort of how I kind of dealt with it was just always doing the essential and never doing anything more than the essential and trying to be or just trying to collect points through uh, subjects that I was naturally um, better in than in others and mm -hmm. trying to pass classes that way and which which brought me also through high school and uh, also um, just just a small way through college. <laughs> Right. What if we do it this way? Right. So you have diff two different frames of reference, the one that you have in your daydreams and the one that you have in your real life. Right. Because uh, Ratius says you're taking this daydream frame of reference, your like your worldview uh, that you've sent into, quote, exile, which I don't think you have. Um, you haven't even said it sent it into um, you haven't even sent it into timeout. Right. You have both of them. Right. How about this? Right. You you have you put you have to put the frames together. Right. You have to overlap them to become sort of one person. If you don't think of yourself as one person yet, you have you are those two from two different frames of reference at once. So it's like a you know a three D movie where you have the glasses with like one's red, one's blue. Right. Like if you were to take off those glasses, right, you'd see that the the that movie I guess looks really strange and it doesn't really look real but like the the uh, the real you quote like the full you also quote right would be you looking through those 3d glasses right where the red side is your daydreams and the blue side is like quote reality or the world around us right does that is that sort of closer to what you're trying to to say lisa is that a bit more accurate it's similar in the concept but i'm not going i'm not going to um I'm not going to be nitpicky here. It's 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 pretty close. The the mm -hmm. um the sentiment of everything and at the end coming together as being one and not being separate um is still there. I would say. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to use this as a metaphor to like understand the concept. Like it's the concept is the same. It's just like the metaphor makes it slightly different, right? Just to make it so that people can visualize it a bit better if they're not, not exactly not, getting not, it. Not really, because mm -hmm. you, are, you are saying that there is a self that can be looked at and can be observed, and I don't claim necessarily that there is a self. We are just awareness at the center of reality. Mm -hmm. But that's that's a bit different. It's just a little bit nitpicky. We don't have to get too much into okay. it. We could just go back to the text, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is... Uh... <laughs> too big brain right i think my uh my world view is a little more uh pragmatic like uh like i would think of it more like time travel right like you take away everything and what do you have left okay so like you you uh you're you wake up one day and you're in the fucking neolithic mm -hmm. yeah you, you what do you have left that is going to help you survive you have what your work ethic maybe your love for your fellow man mm -hmm. if you lay in the cave all day daydreaming you're 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 not contributing <laughs> to the oh, survival of the so, species so, yeah so you're you're the way that your worldview is oriented around like survival and more of like the reality is it's like yeah. you got to be more in reality because that's more just like I went, is it pragmatic? How I think else would you work. survive? Man is not going to survive. Like mm -hmm. right now we have resources. We have affluence. We have abundance right. um, in, in this world that we live in. But if you take all that away, like at the end of the day, you're just human. And how the fuck does a human survive? It survives through society and through imagination. Imagination is what makes us human. It's not bad, but you can't just imagine mm -hmm. you, so you the, have to do so like your worldview is more focused around like you need to be in reality to survive you can't sort of like 
be in your daydreams too much because then you like don't have enough food to put on the table you can't like live through yeah. you can't live i mean that you way. can you can in the world that we live in you can survive that way you can probably even reproduce but mm. but it's it's not the core of what humanity is so i don't mm -hmm. think you'll ever feel fulfilled by it yeah so the way that uh lisa and i are sort of um uh, like framing this is is only possible because well yeah it's only be possible because we are in abundance right it's a, it's like for yeah. you it would be better to function in the real world or i guess reality i suppose um because it's just sort of a very i guess it's is fundamental the word i don't think fundamental is the word was it uh, yeah like i am not i am not a prepper i am not a prepper but if the zombie apocalypse comes tomorrow i That's daydreamers it. aren't going to last long mhm mm i got you i got you Okay, so yeah, the just slightly different ways of, of sort of viewing the world is like, what's important to me right now, because we're in abundance, is taking that, like, self that's in the day, like the frame of references, and then overlapping them to sort of see the world around you, rather than tossing one away, or like trying to, trying to keep it away. It's good to have both of them together, because you can function without having to go hard into reality okay so that's just different points of view different ways you see the world it's more yeah okay. i think i think i probably align more with erasia i think mm -hmm. for all her philosophizing i think she is kind of taking the more pragmatic look about this is what this is just something that you need to do to survive as a human mm -hmm. okay i see that makes that makes sense i can see where you're coming from do i agree mostly I mean, I like money as much as the next guy, and if I'm going to make a bunch of money, I got to be in the real world. Um, but like for like like mental well being, I guess that I I would like because I like to be uh, happy, which that's why I eat a lot of food. Um, I I align more with mine rather than yours. But yeah, I can see how it goes, Lisa. I'm pretty sure I just bastardized your entire philosophy that you were like postulating forward or, or pushing forward. Um, but that's no, the best you, I can you understand it. You, you didn't bastardize anything. You just, um, you know, put your put your own flavor into it, which makes it interesting. It makes it personal. Um, and you know, I in, I think we can agree that maybe all three of us, we own, we all have our own um worldview, which is which is beautiful, which is nice. Um, and this is kind of maybe the agreement we can come to because for me, for example, um being being alive is not for me the highest priority about being alive staying alive survival is i don't i don't see um i don't really see human life as like something that is without any explanation or without like for me personally it's not about me making judgment about other people's lives this is not what i'm saying it's just that um i think that at the end of the day it has just been um given and we should be comfortable with being taken away and that a lot of struggle comes just from holding on to things you know the whole detachment thing mm. detachment of materialistic things detachment of values detachment of certain perspectives you have and if we follow that through right until the end there is also the detachment from life itself and i'm, I'm kind of at that point so if, if someone said to me like well, you're not going to survive with that MD, I would say, okay, it's fine with me. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Arisha goes on um, a, a little more, you know, pounds on, on, you know, what is life? It has to begin somewhere, maybe again, blah, 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 blah. But she asks a question later on that I wanted to ask you guys. Okay, so she directly asks the reader, have you ever wondered if fantasy is the only place where you genuinely feel alive, why are you so secretive about it? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not exactly secretive. I am alive wherever, wherever I can eat a good meal. So whenever I go to like Tolkien's world or like my world, and I'm like, that is a good looking, that is a good looking dish. Um, that is exactly where I want to be, which is like really strange, right? Because like the the idea of a life that most other people have that like when looking at this, I think is a little different. But it's like uh, how uh, how do I put this? Um, like a life being where you're happiest, or a life being what seems the most uh, I wouldn't say real, um, but the most uh, 
poignant like like the, you could like the colors are the brightest the sounds are the loudest right like that kind of thing is what they might be uh thinking of when they say uh, like alive or real for myself because i've sort of read through this and i've sort of gone through the sort of mental gymnastics to find out what makes me happy home is where the heart is or where where home is where the hearth is wherever you can sit down lay your head and have like like eat drink and be merry right that's what is most real to me and i think what's important is finding what makes you happiest or like if something if anything makes you happy at all and if if nothing like something's got to make you satisfied uh and for me it's like where i can sit down and rest and have a good meal right she also mentioned and that's what like i've I'm trying to that that's like my compromise, right? Because you gotta sort of compromise between your uh your sort of daydreams and reality is it's like I can eat food and be happy with food and reality, and I can also drool over like a good piece of meat in my daydreams. Oh, this is the this is the scene from The Matrix where the guy eats the steak and he's like mm. <laughs> he's like, Who cares? It tastes good. Mm hmm Exactly, right? It's it's like I think well, people think that maladaptive daydreaming is something to be feared or like something that makes you subhuman or something like that. So you got to hide it. But um, so so I guess that's what they would hide. But for me, like the compromise is something that I'm not hiding. Right. The thing that makes me happy is something that I'm not hiding. Is that what they're trying to talk about? Probably not. That's probably incorrect, <laughs> to be completely honest. But at this point, I'm just like, I can't like. Like, what do you want me to tell you? Like, I, if, I'm, if food makes me happy, I'm going to go eat a good meal, right? Like, I'm probably going to go and have uh, have some pasta after this, man. It's like, but I've had to sort of pick something to, like, compromise on for those two worlds. That makes me happy. What I'm listing off is something that you want to hide, but something that also makes you happy, right? That can allow your sort of worlds to come together as one person, right? Those are the sort of qualities that I'm going through. And I took a lot of words to say food for me, but dinosaurs might be something for you. Uh, colors might be one. My favorite color is green. My favorite letter is Q. These are just something like that are, but, but, but these are things that people think are immature. When I ask someone, what's your favorite dinosaur? Nobody can answer me, even though a lot of people like dinosaurs when they were a kid. What's oh, your favorite color? I love that. I was just a few months, I was saying like, why did we stop at, as adults asking each other when we meet each other, what your favorite color is or what your favorite animal is or some, or what your favorite Pokemon is. We should just start asking each other that in like business meetings, in networking events, what's your favorite color? You know, like that, right? But my favorite, my favorite, my favorite animal is like the Weka and also the Mandarin duck because the Mandarin duck is beautiful and the Weka is wacky, and that's why those are my favorite. But it's like that's the things that quote kids do, right? That's things you want to quote hide. That's like things you want to hide because like, you you're an adult. You don't do that anymore, right? Uh, because you're quote not a kid, so people would ridicule you for that. I wouldn't. I want to know what your favorite animal is. Say it in the comments. Do the in Spotify or YouTube and all of this kind of stuff. But uh, but I'm going to be honest here, like th at least think about what your like favorite stuff is that you like. Right. Because like just like there's those are the kinds of things that would make you happy. Right. I, I, I think that would make me happy. Um, but I'm interested to hear it. So I don't know. I'm going on really, really long. But that's just the only that's the only answers I can come up with. It's like I don't want to hide that I like food. I mean, I might not exactly be the best looking guy, but man, you know, come on now. I like good noodles. All right, Louisa. If, uh, if, if fantasy is the only place where you genuinely feel alive, why are you so secretive about it? Mm -hmm. I would probably comment on the first part, which is, um, am I really only feeling alive in my fantasies? Am I really? Because for me personally, um, I have been doing some like very interesting, crazy stuff all my life. A lot of people were always afraid of doing in real life or like in the outside world uh, to go like after my philosophy. Um, but I don't know. I have been feeling pretty much alive every time I made a made a decision to do something new, exciting, or or crazy in in the outside world. I never felt like I'm. I had days or weeks or even months where I felt dead in the outside world. They they are there, but I think this is more like a universal human experience of something sometimes just not feeling really there. Um, or there are a lot of people who only ever feel alive when they're on the weekends out with their mates getting drunk, but never under the week. Um, so 
I don't really know about that. It's also a perspective. The, the author makes a lot of assumptions um, here. And on the other hand, if you really only feel alive in your, in your fantasy and um, if you are really, really ashamed of it, if, if you don't make it a part of your reality, the, the answer I think is very, very clear because maybe you're incapable to do that. Maybe people in your life have told you to be ashamed about certain things. Um, maybe, you know, there's just not the, the time and the space as, as Q um, mentioned about uh, his days in, in high school. Uh, where you try to to escape um, the bullies by daydreaming just so much. So he he kind of chose the way how to uh, how to ex express himself in 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 bigger ways because he wasn't really able to do it on on the plane of outside existence at that point. Um, I don't know why why do you feel ashamed about your fantasy? That's probably more something like that's a very personal question. Everybody has to answer for themselves because. Even like even like people who don't MD, that's that's also a very universal human experience. There are people who have fantasies about being a pop singer or um, being a famous author, or they have like certain sexual fantasies that they are very afraid and ashamed of and never want to share. Uh, it's pretty individual, and I think yeah, of course, with MDs, um, there might be a lot of more shame than in regular people for their fantasies. Well, I think uh, I, I missed this like linchpin to what I was saying before, but I think the reason people are like, I, at least uh, I was for a time a little, little terrified of telling people about my maladaptive daydreaming is because, oh, you, oh, you imagine th like, or you have like a, a daydreaming or like a, like a fantasy world, like you being the king of the castle or like, qu like queen of the castle and all this other fantasy stuff, that's stuff for kids, right? That's like the, like one of the big terrors I, I think is it's like you tell someone about it and they look at you funny and they're like, Oh, you really do this in your spare time. All you do is like daydream about these like, like fantasy worlds or whatever. Even though all of us as kids were really imaginative, imaginative, and we daydreamed about this stuff all the time, right? It's like we all had our like little fantasy worlds, but that's what kids do, right? That's like the linchpin, I think, is it's like we don't tell people because we're afraid they're going to think we're childish, right? That art because most people, a lot of people's childish sense of wonder is now gone, right? So it's something that we don't do as adults. You're not supposed to daydream as adults because you know that's just what kids do. Did you share it when you were a child, though? I did a little bit, right? I didn't do it too much. I the my schooling was rough starting really early, but I did I did share with my family before they started laughing at me too, right? But that's the fear, right? That people will laugh at you for having a daydreaming world, right? Yeah, yeah. Cause I because I think that's why I am secretive about it is um. Because I definitely, I definitely went through years where my daydreaming was the only place where I genuinely felt alive. And I was secretive about it from a very, very early age. And I think it's because of what Lisa said. Fantasy, even if you're not a maladaptive daydreamer, is just so personal and individual to you that people don't share it. So yeah, I shared it with my little childhood friends, but I learned very quickly not to. Because nobody gives a fuck what's going on inside your head. Like, they're not going to interact with it in any way that feels organic. Like, you can't even really play with it too much. I suppose some people might. But, but like, yeah, it's not, it's not even conducive to play with other children. So you just keep it to yourself. It's yours. It can only ever be yours. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's not that it's secretive. It's just there's nothing there to interact with the world for me to come to that um to to the thing you said um about it just being so personal and individual um that that really really rings true and to 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 give like an example of actually how personal um your your daydream fantasies are to you and especially um the contents the specific contents of being being a king, being a queen, or slaying the dragon, stuff like that. Um, I have been dating a fellow MD for the past month from the server. Um, okay, I met him here, and so 
and the thing is that even though we have we have talked about many very personal and very intimate things, of course, um, we have never really disclosed the specific contents of our daydreams to each other, because it it's just why. Of course, we can talk about it. We we are not ashamed of it. We are very open about it, and we both have a very um, open and relaxed relationship to our MD. But like. I don't like we wouldn't even see a real reason to disclose those things. Maybe there is a benefit to to it. Probably we would probably feel um closer. But yeah, it's it's just so so individual and so personal. Why lift those exact things out, or why bring it into reality? What 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 usefulness is there to it? There's probably some, but it doesn't really seem like in my situation, even a situation where I could be 100% vulnerable with someone and have someone understand, it doesn't really seem to be that important. Yeah, I I think creativity is really the only place. If, if you're a writer, if you're an artist, maybe you could somehow direct your daydreams to be um, helpful for that. And then you would definitely be sharing them with the world, really. But um. But I mean, if you're, I'm, I'm not an artist, so it really has no bearing on my real life. The closest I could sort of see myself, right? So, um, our, um, well, at least personally, right? But you, like you mentioned, it's very personal. A lot of, a lot of, excuse me, a lot of daydreams, right? Like, I feel like daydreams are like the perfect fuel for like a story, like you mentioned, or like a movie or, right, like an animation, that kind of stuff. Like, because you bring your daydreams into reality so that others can experience them in a way that you would like like them to see it. Um, and like story, like the, the, here's a one that is just like a dying art, I think, but we'll come back soon. It'll be in vogue at some point. Um, like oral storytelling. Not a lot of people are good at it, but like the closest I myself would be able to get to bring it in, bringing it like my daydreams into the real world would be through oral storytelling, right? It seems to be, uh, it's not easy, but I think it would be the like quickest way to get your daydreams out, um, like as you like as much as you can. Oh my god, right? I have so much to say. Okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> not to get us too off course, but um, mm -hmm. I've I've sat down and listened to people whose profession it is to be a storyteller, and they are fucking amazing. I'm telling you, if you mm -hmm. ever get the chance to listen to a professional storyteller, they're so good. They're so good. Um, and I always kind of so when I was young you know e e dreaming of my future and stuff I always wanted children and I always thought that I would tell these stories as bedtime stories to my kids and then oh, my sweet. yeah but then my son was born <laughs> <laughs> and even as a baby even as a little baby in his crib who could not even understand what I was saying to him yet I couldn't do it Mm -hmm. couldn't tell my daydreams to a little baby who couldn't even understand me yet. I, and it was something I always thought I'd be fantastic at, but we're just, we're just it's not. I, yeah. A lot of people think we're natural storytellers. We're not. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you can be, if you want to hone that skill, it's a beautiful skill, but it's uh, very it's rare. Not natural. Yeah. I must say, like being a like storytelling, good professional storytellers. Oh my God, I've only listened to them once, but my lord, it's impressive. It's impressive. Uh, hats off to anybody who can who can. Yeah, tell it's an stories. amazing skill. I wish it were more. I wish it were more popular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what's really popular is uh, is movies and television and stuff like that. But let me tell you, <laughs> yeah, some of that that you see is very wacky. Um. But yeah, no, that's uh, th we sort of that's how I sort of view like telling stories and what why you would keep it secret. We've gone over that, like being very personal, right? You can you can spin them to be a little more impersonal, but you like for those of you out there who are young, at the very least, give it a try, give it a shot. But it's very nice. It's very cool. And at the very least, it's a good experience. So, but yes, there's a lot. There's, well, we mentioned a couple reasons. There are several reasons that you, why you would keep it secret that all sort of stem from the same feeling, from the same place. Um, I think you could come up with a couple more, but at least for me, I think the three of us, well, for me, and I think the three of us, we can sort of all sympathize with the sort of wanting 
to keep it to yourself because uh, because others wouldn't exactly accept it the way that you do, right? Like, uh, accept our daydreams the way that we do. Yeah, I think Horatia kind of lands on the same or a similar answer to me. Um, she goes on to say that, you know, you try to bring it into the real world, but that energy hits a wall, never really reaches the real, real world. Um, and to communicate the feelings in your daydream, there has to be a bridge. Um, and she sort of ends on the quote that, you know, unlike us, people with healthy inner lives are not split. Their worlds are communicating with each other, which goes back to, I think, what you and Lisa were saying earlier, you know, where you're trying, trying to figure out, uh, e you know, each other's worldviews. Um, mm -hmm. Coming to a consensus. Right. Yeah. They have yeah. the Those, they have like, both the, worlds sort of together, whereas we Yeah, the three D glasses thing you were talking about, like those you you are in both worlds at the same time. What you're just kind of ignoring one of them. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. Oh like well actually no, we're close to the end here. I thought we were halfway through. No, so I was no, about no, to be like yeah. we have two hours worth of material here. No, and it's like, a pretty short section. Behind every daydream there is a feeling. It drives your plot, it molds your characters. It's the mastermind behind it all. Every character, every single story is an embodiment of it. The entire narrative content of your specific daydream is driven by an emotion that you failed and continuously failed to express in real life. And as long as this particular emotion remains unexpressed in your real life by your real self, the respective daydream which is driven by it will not stop. Expression, I think, is... Well... Yeah, I don't I don't agree with that. <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily completely wrong. It's one of those things that's again very strongly written, but I think it promotes um us living out our emotions and manifesting them in reality. But this is sort of also like a thing. Um I think the dream world of a lot of psychologists is a world in which everyone can just healthily and openly always can express their emotions and is being accepted and loved and, and recognized. But unfortunately, we don't really live in that world. It's one of those things like, yeah, we want to live on my emotions. And then it's like, OK, but how do I tell my boss that he stinks? So, yeah. um, uh, yeah, or like, you know, how I'm going to tell that attractive work colleague that I think that they are very pretty and I would want to go out with them. So, um, yeah, it's, it would be pretty cool if we could just express everything. I think if the, the closer we are able to come to expressing everything, the more fulfilled and content we feel, I would say. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the world out there is pretty hard to authentic expression. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, I have the answer for the second one, how to tell your colleague they're pretty. You walk up to them, uh, your <laughs> words get stuck in your throat, you start shaking violently, and then you leave. That's Wait, what no, I do. No, here's how you tell your colleague they're pretty. <laughs> you fucking don't. They're your colleague. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you're oppressing my emotions, Dimmer. <laughs> Q, you are so pretty. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I know. It. I haven't even, I haven't, I'm so like whacked out, man. My hair is, I got bedhead like nobody's business. I think, I'm glad you think I'm an incredibly attractive individual. I try. Most beautiful quaka I've ever seen. Quaka? It's a, it's a wecker. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was a harsh insult there. <laughs> Quaka. Mandarin <laughs> duck would be good too, but I, I have to change my profile picture right now. It's I have two of them. One's the Weka that I have right now, and then when I decide to feel uh significantly more flamboyant and colorful, then I switch it to the Mandarin duck. Those are both my favorite animals, by the way. So all of you out there, tell me your favorite animal in spirit, <laughs> or you can email us. Dimmer, you have the email. What's our email? Contact parallel lives at gmail dot com. That, and also on YouTube in the comment section, and then probably somewhere else. Does Spotify have a comment section? No. Oh, um, that, that's a shame. You can add, like, a question to it, though. Mm -hmm. Do I could, that. I like, add our... what, what's your favorite animal? <laughs> yeah, what, what is your favorite animal? And we're going, I'm going I'm to go transmit it to you telepathy-wise. It's the Weka and the Mandarin Duck. There you go. Quaka. Okay. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a quaka. Wrong, wrong animal. I don't know if that's an animal, but it's not the animal. Yeah, I don't animal. know if that's a real animal. All right, Lisa, <laughs> you're up next. What's your favorite animal? Uh, uh, I like parrots. It's not parrots very are awesome. We have... I like parrots and snakes. I like explicitly the African house snake. 
Ooh. The African house snake. What happens when you put a tiny hat on a tiny snake? It's even cuter. All right, yes. Dimmer, your favorite animal. Cuttlefish. Go. Cuttlefish? Ooh. Cuddle. Yeah, they're very pretty. They, they've Ooh. changed the colors. They kind of look like weird little squid things. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, now, favorite color. Green, Yellow. deep, deep evergreen. <laughs> Yellow, deep evergreen. Yellow. Lisa, what's yours? Green. Very deep green. All right, we got the we got green squad, bird squad over here. We got yellow. All right, what is your favorite letter? K. K. Ooh, Lisa. No. No. I think it's you... D. It has oh, very it's... positive. D has very positive vibes. D's got them positive vibes. I like Q. Q's got them wacky vibes because it's like O but better because it's got a little tail and Q always comes with a little friend. If Q doesn't come <laughs> with a friend, that's a that's a strong Q that don't need no U. There you go. That's exactly why I like that little letter Q. There's a lot of other things I like, but we'll stop at that for now. Is there anything else we want to go over? Uh, just how weird the last line is, I think. <laughs> she, she makes sort of a metaphor in that final paragraph, and then she just ends. But before you can find the food, find your mouth first. <laughs> All right, everybody, everybody, find your mouth, right? Find I mean, your mouth. Mouth found. Uh, this is with two such, fingers. Yeah, it's such a wild, um, you know, poignant, <laughs> strongly worded blog. And then the it sounds so derpy. Sentence. It sounds so derpy. <laughs> the last sentence, find your mouth. I like, I, it's like, a, uh, it's like comedy relief. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, there you go. That is part five. Yep. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that's it for this episode. I believe that's the uh, the last bit that we can. Oh my! Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is uh, that is part five of of Aratia's Guide to Maladaptive Daydreaming, a work of art. Find your mouth first, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Final final thoughts on it. Like, um, I think it depends on when you read this, what you are going to walk away with. Like, um, I remember reading this when I first found the community and, uh, and reading it now, I get very different things out of it because now that I've, I've sat with my maladaptive daydreaming for several years and I know myself better and I know my MD better, this doesn't land with me as much as it did like the first time I read it. And even the first time I read it, I was a little bit taken aback. I felt like when I was reading this, I felt like I was walking through a bunch of doorways and I kept hitting my head on the top of the door frame. Like, it's like, oh, this like makes sense, except for the fact that I keep hitting my head because some of this really does not work for me. Some of it, it just doesn't land for me. I've mentioned that a couple times throughout these, uh, th these, uh, these, uh, these, well, not sessions, these sort of, uh, podcasts we've been going over, Erasure's Guide to Maladaptive Daydreaming. Like, it all sort of, it looks really good and I can get with most of it and then I whack my head on the top of the door frame. So it's a very strange way of putting it, but that's exactly my like the vibes and the feelings I got as I got through this. For me, the whole thing feels like um, when you when you see a friend of yours who isn't really a friend of you anymore, just um, out of coincidence, and you see them and you go like, "Ha!" Huh, and then you immediately go, "Wait." I stopped being friends with them for a good reason. Oh mm -hmm. my God. Yes. That's exactly what this sounds like. Actually. I have a friend who knows everything. She knows you and your relationship better than you do. And she will tell you about it. And like, it comes from a good place. Cause she's my friend, but no bitch. You don't know my relationship better than I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, You know what I mean? Like, she's trying to help, but she's kind of a douche. So, yeah, I think that's about it for now. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you next time on Parallel Lives. I'd like to thank Lisa for coming in as our guest. Thank you, Lisa, for coming by. Yeah, you had a great time. Thank you. Anytime, anytime. Uh, Dimmer, roll the outro. That's going to do it for this episode of Parallel Lives. Um, we put out new episodes on the 1st and 16th of every month sorry our, our schedule's been a little messy lately we've been dealing with stuff but um but yeah usually the 1st and 16th of every month you can listen to us on youtube spotify google apple everywhere leave comments like subscribe join the discord 
thank you everybody for coming. We will see you in the next episode. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>